Hi everybody, this is Tim Erden, author of Statistics in Plain English, and in this video I'm going to demonstrate how to conduct and interpret a factor analysis in R. So, uh, if you already use R or know how to use R, um, then the R Studio layout should be familiar to you. If this if R is new to you, then you might want to take a quick look at a different video that I produced called um, descriptives and uh, general overview of R. That'll, in that video, I kind of describe the different windows um, that are in the R Studio and how it works. So I have already, um, in a previous analysis, uh, um, loaded the data set. I have an SPSS data file that I have imported into R and um, now we're going to perform a factor analysis on it. So this factor analysis um, is using data that I collected from a sample of high school students. <clears throat> and one of the things that I measured in a survey was um, their something called goals, their goals. And there's three different kinds of goals that I measured. And these are called task goals, approach goals, and avoidance goals. So task goals are things like uh, I want to really understand my classwork and I want to get better at my schoolwork. Uh, I want to improve my skills. Those are task goals. Approach goals are the desire to do better than other students. Um, so I want to be one of the best students in the class. I want to perform better than other students. I feel successful when I do better than other students, those kinds of things. And avoidance goals represent a desire to avoid doing worse than others. So I don't want to do worse than other students. One of my goals is to avoid looking um, worse than other students in the class, um, things like that. So I had, I think, about five or six survey items for each of these different kinds of goals, task goals, approach goals, and avoidance goals. And... Um, what I wanted to do is see if the items on these three goal constructs, if they loaded onto different factors. So first I'm gonna run this line here, which is sort of telling um, R what the factors are and um, selecting the data for the analysis. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna run a quick summary of the selected data so that I can see what the variables are that have been included. And as you can see, um, they're just different items referring to these different kinds of goals. So here's the first task goal item is there and it's got the minimum, the 25th percentile, the median, the mean, um, the 75th percentile and the maximum. So it just gives me kind of summary statistics for that survey item. Here's the first item in the approach goal. Here's the first item in the avoidance goal. And as you can see, there's several for each. So there's second task goal, second approach, second avoidance, third approach, third task, fourth task. So they weren't presented all in order in the survey. So they jump around a little bit, but it looks like I have um, five task goal items five avoidance goal items, and six approach goal items. Here's the sixth one. So this um, factor analysis is going to see whether these items actually load on separate factors. So next, up here, I need to install the package. This is a script in R uh, that will um, um, help me look at the number of factors that should come out of this factor analysis. So I'm gonna, whoops, run that. I've run that before. That's why it gives me this, do you wanna upload the package? I'm gonna say no, because I know I've already uploaded it. So it just down here shows that it's installing that. And then I'm gonna require this. It's a part of the script. Okay, now it's time to actually run up here with this part, um, the factor analysis. So this is 
a command to get the eigenvalues. This is a command to give me a scree plot, those two lines. And over here in this right side, we see a scree plot. In factor analysis, a scree plot can sometimes be useful for um, figuring out how many factors you should retain or you should keep from your factor analysis. So one cutoff for deciding how many factors are worth keeping is um, sometimes people will say, I, I kept factors that had an eigenvalue greater than one. So here is the, these green triangles here represent the eigenvalue of one line. And as you can see, we have um, one, two, three factors that have an eigenvalue at least of one, a fourth factor that's right around one, and then the remaining factors uh, keep going down uh, further away from an eigenvalue of one. Um, factor analysis will always give you the same number of factors as there are items in the analysis. So you can see there's 16 factors here. You can have a factor analysis with one item on each factor. And that, of course, will give you the greatest separation of factors. But that's not very useful to just have each item be its own factor. Then, you know, you might as well just analyze each item separately. We want to find a way of grouping these items into meaningful groups. And so uh, having eigenvalues greater than one is one way of doing that. So that's what the plot tells you. Now here, uh, we've got print eigenvalues. So if we just plotted them. Now let's print them. And this here shows you the eigenvalues that you get. So the first factor that comes out of the factor analysis has an eigenvalue of 4.639. That is a healthy eigenvalue. The second one, 2.672. Third one, 1.296. Fourth one, 0.9236. So as you can see, that's what we see on this plot. First factor has an eigenvalue of 4.69. Second one has an eigenvalue of 2.67. Third one has an eigenvalue of 1.296. And the fourth one is just below 1 at 0.92. So uh, <clears throat> the printing of the eigenvalues and the graph of the scree plot basically give you the same information. Now, this is where we're telling um, um, R <clears throat> to... Uh, produce a three-factor solution. So you can tell it ahead of time how many factors you want. I looked at the eigenvalues. I saw three eigenvalues greater than three, and I said, okay, give me the three-factor solution and do very max rotation. Um, uh, there's different kinds of rotation in factor analysis. Very max is one. This is where you get the maximum separation between each factor. Um, there's also... Uh, or um, uh, an oblique rotation. Uh, that is when the factors are allowed to be more correlated with each other. So we're just going to do very max here. This is very common in uh, um, exploratory factor analysis. If I were actually going to do this um, for my own sort of research purposes, I would probably do a rotation that is oblique, um, uh, that is allows the factors to be correlated because I just happen to know that there's often a pretty decent correlation between um, the approach and avoidance uh, items. But we'll do very max here. We'll run that. And then it doesn't print anything, as you can see. It just runs it. So we need this next line here to print the actual factors. And um, we're telling it this cutoff point three, we're saying um, don't print factor loadings that are smaller than point three. Um, every factor has all of the items, uh, all 16 items loaded on it. Uh, so once you get below point three, um, it gets to be a little messy and not all that useful. So you can suppress the loadings that are below point three, and then you can sort them um, into these different factors. So it's easier to interpret. So we run that, and uh, here's what we get. Um, so uh, first it tells us the uniqueness of each item. Um, so 
how strongly the item loads on its own factor and not on other factors uh, is sort of what that's telling you. So let's take a look at this rotated factor matrix. And we see in factor one, we have the first four avoidance items. So that's good. The avoidance items are sort of there, looking like they're making a clean factor. And then this item here, approach six, is loading um, most strongly, more strongly on the avoidance factor than it is on the approach factor. So approach six is looking like it's not doing a good job of representing an approach orientation. It looks like it's representing an avoidance orientation more. So that would be an item that we would look at very closely and say, uh, is this item really seem to be representing what we thought it was, or does it seem like it's representing something different than we thought? And it might be uh, something that is eliminated from um, a scale that you create uh, based on the factor analysis. You can see here that all of the task items, let's see if I can highlight this, all of the task items loaded on their own separate factor and none of them cross-loaded strongly on the other two factors. So um, it looks like the task items are a clean separate factor. Okay, and then over here, the approach items so we already know that approach, the sixth approach item uh, loaded more strongly on the avoidance factor. And so it doesn't even show up in this approach factor. And these first three items, approach two, approach three, and approach four, look like they're pretty strongly loaded onto the approach factor. So that's good. And then we have all of this kind of messy cross-loading. So approach five, actually loads on all three factors pretty weakly um, and is looking like it's not a good item for discriminating between these three different types of goals. So that might be something that we eliminate. Approach one loads about equally, not real strongly, but about equally on both the avoidance factor and the approach factor. Um, so that might not be a great representation of approach goals either. I mentioned um, most analyses shows that the approach items and the avoidance items often uh, will be pretty strongly correlated with each other. And you can see that here with uh, several of these, three of these approach items, actually four approach items, loading pretty strongly onto uh, the avoidance factor as well. So if I'm looking at this, I'm saying, okay, um, I've got a decent avoidance factor with those first four avoidance goals. I've got a very strong task factor. And then the approach factor is kind of messy. I'm not really sure um, whether I've got a good approach items factor because there's these cross loadings <clears throat> between some of the approach items with the avoidance factor. If I look down here, um, I can see the proportion of variance that each factor explains. So they, each factor explains some of the overall variance in the collection of 16 items altogether. So um, uh, we can see there's 18% explained by that first factor, 14% of the variance explained by the second one, 13 explained by the third one. Each factor is going to explain a little bit less variance um, uh, that's um, part of what goes into the eigenvalue and how you're deciding how many factors to keep. So once you start getting factors that aren't explaining much variance, it becomes questionable whether they're worth keeping or not. And then cumulatively, uh, these three factors combined are explaining 44% of the overall variance in the items. This last little thing is kind of interesting. Test of hypothesis that three factors are sufficient. So uh, do the three factors adequately capture enough of the variance in the items um, to be sufficient? And sufficient is a subjective call. But you get a chi-square statistic from this uh, right here, which is a large chi-square statistic, and you get a p-value. 
and this is going to be a tiny p-value. So it's saying that the test of basically the um, um, insufficiency of the model fit, of the fit of the data to these three factors, is statistically significant. Meaning, you might need more factors to sufficiently capture this. Now, I'll tell you, um, this test of statistical significance uh, is often statistically significant. So you're often going to get a statistic that says, you know, if you had more factors, you could better um, describe these data. You could explain more of the variance in these data. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that you should use more factors. So if I ran a four-factor solution, I know I could explain more variance. But is that fourth factor going to be meaningful enough for me to... Um, to want to include it? Is it going to make sense conceptually? Now, because of these cross-loadings of these items here, uh, it might make sense to have a fourth factor and say, okay, maybe this approach goal scale really needs to be divided into two factors because there's some messiness in this, uh, in this approach factor. So it'd be worth looking at, seeing if, <clears throat> um, if a, a four-factor solution would look better. But um, it's not just a matter of whether this test is statistically significant. You need to choose the number of factors based on other issues as well, like do the four factors make sense conceptually? Do they fit with existing theory? Things like that. Okay, so that's enough for this. Um, there's a lot more that we could talk about with factor analysis. I'm showing you a very simple version of it. And I hope that's helpful.